clear to you please just uh, stop me and uh, ask questions because otherwise it will you will miss out on a lot of things okay so uh, if you don't ask questions then i might go fast and uh, things might not uh, be clear to you okay so yeah so this is like a three day session that i'm planning to take so in these three day sessions so what i expect is that after uh, the third day you guys should be able to uh, create your own uh, rl experiments okay like create your own rl environment create your own rl setup and you can have a training model setup uh, that you can use to further develop your research in rl or so okay so now before we start uh, so if i understand correctly are all of you guys from the computer science department or is it a mixed bag it's a mixture okay it's a mixture so uh, how many guys are here are familiar with what reinforcement learning is or at least have done some coursework or some projects beforehand <coughs> okay uh, quite a few so yeah uh, those of you who are raising your hands could you tell me like how did you get introduced to reinforcement learning and what all you have covered so far just unmute and talk it's fine Okay, for me, it was mostly just exploring the OpenAI gem and then getting okay. to know how the uh, environments are set up and everything. Okay, so were you able to uh, get that clearly? How... No, no, I have not actually experimented much, but I would like to okay. after this session. Yeah, so that is one of my plan. I would like to go through in detail about what OpenAI gem does and how anyone can basically. code their own environment using open ai gem so basically you should be able to you should uh, be able to once you have an idea you can quickly train it uh, and test your rl hypothesis right and uh, yeah so anyone has done any projects before in reinforcement learning any hands on experience okay so jensen raised his hands so could you explain what what you did yeah uh, so i have done a project in uh, about a traffic light uh, control simulator so uh, i have created a simulation actually i did not use open ai gym but i okay. uh, used pygame and i created the entire uh, model like the entire environment environment and, okay yeah and i actually wanted to uh, like uh, use q learning or like uh, deep q learning but like mm -hmm. the state space was very large so i wasn't able to do that okay i didn't so, know how to like discretize a state space okay so you have a continuous state space is it yeah yeah <coughs> or is it an image what is it exactly uh, it is actually uh, it's like a, a game only it's like a game ka simulation and yeah like, so are you passing images as input to the uh, rl model or no uh, are you passing some vector no it is uh, i'm uh, like what i have created a like a, a model and like i created mm -hmm. it using chat gpt actually and it mm -hmm. uh, actually using all the uh, information about like there are multiple cars right there are multiple cars mm -hmm. and traffic signals so like that information is a, is like a uh, it's like a multi, like there are a lo lot of list and arrays and dictionary so that i'm using okay. to feed it in and besides that i have okay. done uh, uh, like i've done two projects on q learning so one okay. is like i have done uh, one project on uh, like mapping all but there's a, like a drone mapping situation like uh, mm -hmm. uh, like there is a what the objective is like you have to uh, let the drone reach at uh, a particular height and you have to ensure that the drone uh, traverses through all of the grids in the terrain and the terrain has a height attribute okay. so it needs to op optimize by uh, choosing where the direction and the paths okay you want to basically do a traveling salesman kind of a thing you have to cover all cells right yeah but there's a height attribute so height attribute does what it. does that do does it 
help me to cover more cells at uh, faster rate height is a height is a height is a terrain right so it is like the oh, drone okay, okay. should be at a 1 meter okay. height above like 1 unit height above the terrain then only it is registered otherwise it's okay. not a valid action okay okay got it so you have to fly up to a certain height in order to record an observation right yeah yeah that was easily done using q learning okay so then the state space was uh, how big uh like for that i've considered like it was i think uh, 10 by 10 grid uh okay. it was actually a, uh, yeah it was actually a 4 by 4 grid uh, no it's a 4 by 5 by 5 grid and the height attributes uh, were from like 0 to 4 or something like that okay yeah, and that drone had a condition uh yeah go on go on uh the drone had a condition like the drone should always be above the terrain. it was like a, a testing like it was a basically my rl ka ia so like testing okay. like you learning that it's not actually a real life uh, emulation or anything no no that's fine that's fine it's a simulation uh, game that you tried right yeah yeah okay okay so uh if i understand you are familiar with implementing q learning and to some extent dql is it yeah yeah okay yeah so uh, those of you who just uh couldn't grasp what we discussed don't worry uh, we'll uh, go in detail so that uh, at the end of the three uh, at third day you would be able to make sense of uh, what all we just discussed okay so uh, if i understand correctly did you guys have any course work on reinforcement learning uh, in your the the computer department has a course on reinforcement learning in the final year but as of right now okay. currently we don't have in the current years okay so you guys are uh, i believe in your second and third year right yeah majority of us yeah. okay okay <coughs> so uh so if i understand correctly most of you are not not familiar with our reinforcement learning right you are just starting out yeah right. that would be the case sorry could you repeat yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, okay okay uh, so uh, yeah so just understand uh, in this session uh, my aim is not to go in depth into the concepts okay it's more of a it's a short tutorial like right? it's a 6 hour uh, tutorial so my aim is to give you a more hands on uh, implementation details so but yes if you feel anywhere that your concepts are Uh, unclear or if you don't understand anything and this might be the case because this is something very new to you guys please stop me please ask questions i'll stop and explain everything okay so uh, so we know today's agenda right so today's ad- agenda is to introduce you what reinforcement learning is about and to try to give you a flavor maybe i'll try to show some running examples and can uh, always discuss in detail whatever uh, you feel is unclear to you and that that should cover to us for today right so sounds good yes yes okay so i'll start let me know if you can see my screen okay yes it's visible okay so i have this link so there is a book called sutton and barto so if you guys will do a course on reinforcement learning this is the primary book that you guys uh, will be following to uh, throughout the course and uh, you have to understand that rl has two components one is the uh, simple rl and the other is the deep rl so can anyone tell me what do you think would be the difference between rl and a deep rl like when do i call an rl model a deep rl model or even simpler what do we mean by deep learning like when we have a machine learning model when can we say that the machine learning model is a deep learning model where is the fine line what is the definition rather 
uh, when we are using a neural network that has uh, multiple layers, like more than three. So, okay. Layers. Okay. So there is a name for it, right? Do you know that? Deep learning. Yeah, deep learning. But if you have a multiple layered neural network, so you have a perceptron model, right? So if you have multi layered, multiple layers, so you call it as a multi layered perceptron or an MLP, right? Uh, that I'm not. Uh, that I okay. Don't. Okay. Okay. So basically, what happens is a neural network basically works as a perceptron model. So a single layer of perceptron is uh, what uh, people used to work with earlier. But then in the early 1990s, people realized that if you uh, add in multiple layers, then uh, there were several limitations of using a single layered perceptron. So if you had multiple layer. So you call it as a multi-layered perceptron, okay? And that's a deep learning model. And like uh, you just mentioned, whenever you have a neural network that has multiple layers, that is something we call as a deep learning model, okay? <coughs> okay, so a deep learning is clear. Now, can someone explain what do you think could RL be about? Like what, according to you, is reinforcement learning somebody who is unfamiliar and who is uh, joining for the first time what are your like expectation or understanding like what do you think could be the case if you have any idea about it uh, we are training the model to reach a particular goal by giving it a feedback correct correct and uh, why do you think uh, rl is different from a supervised model or an unsupervised uh, learning model like why do we need to call it as reinforcement learning? Uh, as much as I know, uh, in supervised learning, we um, we have a label, right? So we have told okay. the model that this is uh, this is what the output should be. Okay. And uh, and it's like uh, you have uh, we are comparing it to it, comparing okay. the result of the model to the labeled output. But in reinforcement learning, we are um, it's like uh, you are at a particular point. So should you go right or should you go left? Uh, we are telling it like that. So then why can't I call it unsupervised learning? Um, then we I don't have know. labels, right? That I don't. OK, uh, so I'll tell you the main difference between supervised learning, unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning is the presence of a data set. So you train a model in supervised learning. You need to have a data set available with you. So a data set can be of two types. It can be a labeled data. It can be an unlabeled data, right? So if you have a labeled data, you compare those two things. You train your loss function, minimize it. And what you have is a supervised learning model. So you can create a regression model. You can create a classifier model. OK, so there is a data that you have. Same with unsupervised learning. You have a big data set, millions and millions of data set, but you don't have an existing label to it. OK, so it's like you know a particular uh, column looks like, but you don't know how to classify it. So you don't classify those things as a cat or a dog. You don't give it a label, but you classify based on their similarity scores. OK, so that is unsupervised learning. The difference in reinforcement learning is, like you mentioned, the aim is simple. You want to achieve a goal or rather to make it more general. Your aim is to achieve a behavior or a trait. And how do you do that? You do that through trial and error. OK. Trial and error in the sense you don't have a pre recorded data set that you're training your model on. In reinforcement learning, we don't use any sort of data sets. It's like a human, when a human being is learning a certain behavior or learning a certain habit, you don't need to repeat that. You don't need to see that particular example a million times in order to do that task, right? You try something, it fails. Your brain gives you a signal whether it was a success or a failure. And then you based on uh, the reward. If it was a low reward action, you tend to avoid that. If it's a high reward action, you tend to do that multiple times. OK, very simple example. Imagine a little baby who is learning just to walk. OK, so it's not like a uh, small baby. You would just uh, feed in. You don't just uh, give the baby hundreds and millions of YouTube videos. OK, you just see this video and learn how to walk, right? That's not how it works. So it's like the baby has to try something, OK? It has to move its limb in a certain fashion and fall down. 
then if it gets hurt it uh, the the baby the baby's mind registers the signal that okay this is not something that i would like to do so they try out some different combinations and eventually they learn how to walk okay so this uh, kind of a method is called reinforcement learning so you are basically reinforcing certain actions that are more beneficial to you and trying to suppress certain actions which are not useful to you so eventually to wrap, wrap it up you observe a state okay and based on the state you take an action okay like for example if you are driving a car the decision to take left or right is dependent on what you see in front of you okay so your observation is whatever you see in front of you the image is the whole state for you so based on how the traffic light condition is or how the road turning is you make a decision to make a left or a right okay now let's say you guy uh, we human beings are rational beings right so we know how a traffic signal works okay or how the lanes are predefined imagine you didn't know anything about traffic rules okay you are in a completely different uh, country where you are not aware of the traffic rules what the traffic light looks like so and imagine you are the only vehicle okay and your aim is to stay on the road as much as possible so what do you do you try to drive your car in a straight direction if you see a left turn then you should turn your steering in that particular direction in order to make a left turn if you don't then your car might go straight and it might crash into some uh, into any obstacle uh, that is not on the road right so if that happens then your car is damaged and uh, you you don't want to do that again right of course this happens everything happens in simulations why because uh, doing this trial and error in a real hardware is very expensive right so one needs to de design a simulation because in simulations you can uh, have hundreds and uh, millions of failure experiments without any uh, cost attached to it right now uh, yeah so you in rl your aim is to learn a mapping from a state to an action right is this clear till now are you guys still with me yes yes okay so yeah this book has uh, most of the things that you will be covering so uh, here i'll just give you a tldr version of what each concept is and then uh, we'll see how it goes okay so yeah like i said what rl is about rl is about trial and error search there is a delayed reward and you have exploration versus exploitation trade off so what do you mean by delayed reward uh, delayed reward in the sense that every time the reward that you get need not be instantaneous so if you do an action it's not like you will uh, get uh, the rewards immediately sometimes the reward comes at a later stage in life right like uh, if you do a certain action it might be possible that you might get to know the uh, reward of it after let's say 100 seconds or at the end of the day something like that so and that's a very real life uh, kind of a scenario you don't always get immediate reward for each action that you take okay so the rewards are sparse in nature now you look at this uh, figure 1.1 so rl basically has two components okay agent agent is the one who is taking the action in our case a human would be an agent okay and environment is basically everything in the universe apart from the agent what it is interacting with right so what the agent feeds in the environment the agent basically feeds an action into the environment okay so agent decides what action i should take it feeds the action into the environment and because the agent acted in the environment the environment changes right based on your action the environment around you changes and once the environment changes the environment returns you two things one is what is the next state the state at uh, time t plus 1 and the reward at time t plus 1 okay the state will tell the agent okay now you are in this state what to do next and reward is the uh, environment almost always has a way to evaluate the action that you have so good environment will always have a metric to evaluate whatever action you took right is that clear the reward process part yes yes okay now uh, what do you think could be a reward like okay 
so a reward in reinforcement learning is a quantitative number okay or more importantly it's a scalar number so if a reward is high that means it corresponds to a high score so i should be taking an action that gives me a higher reward if not uh if i get a negative reward then that means it's a bad uh bad action i should not do that the goal of reinforcement learning is i want to maximize the total reward that i collect over time so if i run this particular simulation for let's say 100 time steps so i'll have rewards r0 r1 r2 dot 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 till r100 so if i sum it all up so the sum of all the rewards should be maximum that should be my aim if that i can achieve then then that means uh, my agent has learned whatever i wanted it to learn now there's a very uh, big assumption in this okay to to make a agent learn a certain behavior there is a big assumption uh, in this whole model so can you tell me what do you think would the assumption be let's discuss that we are not on the goal no you you will get an idea that you are on the goal that is all you can always set that a set of states is a goal state you can always set that to be true but there is something more inherent if you think about it that there is only one agent yes that is there there is only one agent uh, again that's a very different uh, area altogether like there is single agent reinforcement learning there is multi agent but even let's say consider only one agent if i want one agent to learn a particular behavior there is still a very big assumption okay uh, that uh, that is independent of the number of agents actually and that i'll hint you is somewhere here in the reward part is it that uh, after every action we always should get a reward yeah let's assume a simplistic case that after every action you get a reward even if you don't then also rl works but let's say you get a reward after every action that is also fine even if it's not the assumption uh, case rl still uh, works fine right like because we say that rl works well with delayed rewards as well but yeah uh, something along the lines of the reward function that's a big assumption about reinforcement learning <coughs> okay so uh, again i'll give you more hints so when you are designing your model so your agent is something that you have to design the behavior of the agent like what all actions that the agent can take okay the agent can't take any random actions right the actions are constrained right so if i am let's say playing a video game the actions are what are the keys i can press right so these are constrained in the environment also the states are constrained okay there are only a certain states that the agent can act, have access to right so this environment is actually design choice so it's the user that is designing the environment okay when in simulation of course now can you think what could be a, something lacking with the reward i think there's this assumption that uh, you need to know the criteria of like uh, getting the reward means like how yes. do you know a reward is better than the other yes or yes. how that action is, that is correct exactly correct so reward is something that you are engineering okay you are engineering or designing the reward by hand and your rl model is only as good as the reward that you design okay so you might think okay designing this particular reward will give me the desired behavior but that is again an assumption you are making right so let's say if i want to drive a car on a uh, lane okay so how do i design a reward so let's say you might say okay uh, i should give it a penalty for when it goes outside the road or when it drives off the lane or something like that so you can design a reward like if it drives off the road for every time step you'll get a reward of minus 1 if it crashes into another vehicle it's a minus 10 and if it drives correctly you give it a plus 1 okay 
So you are always tuning the parameters, right? So because you don't know how the reward should look like, it's again a design that a user is making. So your behavior would be as good as the reward function that you are designing, right? And uh, reinforcement learning is actually an optimization algorithm. Okay, so uh, given a state action and the reward, <coughs> RL will always find me the optimal solution. That is guaranteed in reinforcement learning, but that optimality is very much dependent on how the state is designed, how the action is designed, and how the rewards are designed, right? So that is one very fundamental assumption that RL uh, goes with that your behavior is only as good as the reward function that you have. Okay. So like uh, I said, reward signal is given by the environment at each time step. So we are assuming that at each time step we are getting some reward. So when I say delayed reward, uh, at a particular time step, the reward might be null also, right? You can get a zero reward. That is, but at each time step you will get something, even if it's zero or non-zero. You will still get some reward, okay? But yeah, there might be case where uh, the rewards are sparse in nature. So any example you can think where the rewards can be delayed? Any simplistic example? Uh, I have a question. Yeah. So uh, can you repeat uh, what is the assumption that uh, the reward is? Um, I didn't so, get that part. The assumption part. So the reward is something that uh, you are designing, right? to uh, help an agent learn something, uh, you are designing how the reward should look like, right? Because you are designing the yes. environment, right? When you are developing yeah, an RL so model. We are engineering the rewards according yes. to our some understanding intuition. of it. Yes, some intuition that you might have, right? So what is the assumption there? Assumption is that, that you reward, might think rewards will work. Yeah, that's that's what your assumption is. Your assumption is if I give okay. this particular reward, I should expect this behavior. Okay, so right. it's not. Uh, we are not sure about it, but we are trying it. We are doing the trial yeah. and error thing with reward also. That, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's a very big problem in reinforcement learning. Actually, the rewards are not very oh. straightforward to always design. Okay, so if the behavior is very complicated, okay, let's say you want to do a very complex task. Like for example, if you want to develop an agent for playing chess, then reward is very simple. Okay, so if you win, you get a reward of one. If you lose, you get a reward of zero. Okay, but uh, there are certain complicated actions uh, like in robotics or you have uh, autonomous driving where the rewards are not very straightforward because you have too many components to deal with, right? You have the steering component, you have the acceleration, you have the brake. Clutch. You have multiple different different actions. You have multiple different states. Okay. Now you want to basically assign that each particular state should map to a particular action combination, and developing that kind of a reward oftentimes is not very straightforward. So, from a developer perspective, it is also kind of a trial and error. Okay. So you are trying out certain reward, and you are trying it with the hope that it should give me the optimal performance. Or it should give me what I expect it to do. Okay. Yes. <laughs> now, uh, some terminologies. Policy. Policy pi is basically the mapping of states to action. So, this particular part, if I highlight this, where I'm circling my arrow, this is where we need the reinforcement learning agent, right? The reinforcement learning agent should tell me what action to take. Given I have the state and the reward, what is the action I should take? So I need a reinforcement learning agent. So my policy pi basically is mapping this state to the action. Okay. So given a state, what action I should take? So you think of it as a black box. Okay. So there is a black box. Think of it as a neural network. You are passing in the state that goes into a neural net and you're outputting a particular action. Okay. So that neural network or that box that you have. We denote it by pi and we call it as a policy. Policy meaning you are, it's some mapping a function that maps from states to action. Okay. So right now we are uh, not in the deep RL domain. Okay. So you think of it as a simply as a function. Don't think of it as a neural net. It's a simple function that is mapping from states to action. We are dealing with 
RL. Okay, what are the limitations and scope? Uh, state des signal design is overlooked. Again, you need to give what are the state that the agent should have. Okay. So let's say if I am developing an agent to play a game of chess, what do you think could be the state that the agent should get? Okay, let's say you're playing, developing a game of. Let's say you're developing an agent to beat the human world champion in chess. So to, in order to take an action, the agent should know some behavior, something about the environment, right? So that is a state that is also needs to be fed into the agent. So what do you think could the state look like in such a scenario? Or let's say even take a simpler example. Let's take the example of tic-tac-toe, okay? Tic-tac-toe is a simple game, right? It's a three cross three uh, box where you fill in with X's and zeros and you want to beat your opponent in tic-tac-toe. What could be a state? What the state could look like in this case? The entire board plus the turn which player is playing. No, let's see. Uh, it's a two player. Yeah, that's true. Uh, let's say you are only playing. playing uh, but how do you feed in the board exactly? I mean, like, like you want uh, to you need there to are many extract ways. some. Mm -hmm. uh, like one way I know for chess, is I think I saw it in a video. It's like uh, mm -hmm. for chess, you need to know the position of uh, all the uh, like uh, all the pieces, pieces. and all, all the, the every square, right? <coughs> so yeah. uh, it was like uh, they converted uh, the entire thing into a binary uh, combination for right. a state and. Mm -hmm. uh, Actually, I forgot a little bit how uh, it was exactly. I think it was like in the pawn, uh, like pawn position, you can represent it in the like from zero to eight squares in every row. You can uh, represent like where, where is the pawn. So you can you have a one list for pawn, and then one list for mm -hmm. the rooks and the bishops and all that. And since it's okay. a binary number, uh, you can convert it into a decimal, and at the end you you get a single yeah. simplest representation. It was okay. using it actually. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that is that is one way. So for chess, let's say it's very straightforward, right? You can design an environment like that. Now let's move to a more real life example. Let's say driving a car. Now, how do you represent what you see in front of you to the agent? You need some representation, right? That the agent needs to take into account. That is also something you need to design, okay? Just like how you design the reward. What is being fed into the agent? Like, okay, as a human being, we can see an image and register it. We know that this is a car in front of me. This is a tree. This is a road. OK, but agent is not as smart, right? Need to give some representation. Now that is not very straightforward, right? Uh, how do you represent the state and feed it to an agent? So that is something we need to design. We need to pass important, important features to the agent such that the agent has all the variables that it needs to take a look at and accordingly take an action, right? So that is one limitation. That state design is overlooked. So that's one limitation. You need to figure out ways on how to design state so that you can feed in the important features to the agent. Okay, focus on value function estimate. So we didn't discuss what a value function is. So maybe I'll skip that for now. Yeah. So I'll I'll skip what a value function is, but uh, please do. Uh, Give it a read. So what I'll do is I'll paste this link in the chat. Let me see. Can I add something in the chat? The chat might have been disabled. Uh... Okay. So uh, okay, I'll share it with you guys later. You can uh, circulate it. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Now uh, we'll take a look at uh, something called as a bandit problem. OK, so a bandit problem. Is a very simple game, so let me try to. Pull this up and see if I can. Help you understand bandit. So OK, so this is. <clears throat> an example code. Uh, that I have. So this is a game called as a bandit, OK? So how a bandit problem looks like is as follows. It's a very simple game. So you think of 
a bandit as a slot machine. So you see this kind of slot machine in a casino where it has only one arm. Okay. Now your aim is if you pull that arm, you will get a certain combinations and you have the values for each combinations. And once you get that particular combinations, you will get a particular reward for that, whatever you get. Okay. Then do that multiple times. You will get an average reward. You total it and you earn some uh, money at the end of it, right? But the uh, caveat is every time you pull the arm, there is a cost associated with it. Okay. You are actually feeding in some money to pull the liver. Right. So uh, the overview is uh, in RL, the agent is repeatedly faced with a choice among different options or actions. After each choice, it receives a numerical reward chosen from a stationary or non stationary probability distribution that depends on the action you selected. Objective is to maximize the expected total reward. So this is like one of the simplest <clears throat> example. So let's say you have three choices and you want to select uh, one of the three choices at every time step so that your overall reward is maximized. Now think of it like this. So each of these slot machine, so whoever is the casino owner has designed the slot machine, right? So behind this slot machine, there is a way in which uh, these uh, numbers appear, okay? And uh, there is basically a, a reward associated with it. So it might be that pulling sl slot machine one will give you a higher reward than pulling slot machine two, or pulling slot machine two can give you a higher reward than pulling slot machine three. So uh, these rewards are inherently designed by the casino owner, okay? But you as a user are not aware of it. So what do you do initially? You want to figure out which is the best slot machine so that I can keep pulling it eventually to get the maximal pos maximum possible reward over time. So what should I do? Pull the liver for uh, each of the machines once. Okay, let's say let's say I pull this. I get a reward of hundred. I got a reward of zero. Okay. I pull this combination because I don't know what this uh, orange is. I don't know. So this combination is not present over here, right? These three combinations. So I got a reward of zero. I pulled it once. I got a reward of zero. If I pull this again, the combination would be different. The reward would be different. So you understand the reward is not a single value. It's rather a distribution. Okay. So based on the different different combinations, the rewards are a distribution. Let's say I pull this. I get a reward of 45 because this combination is registered. I get a reward of 45. Okay. Now I pull this once. <clears throat> I got a reward of zero. So what I did is I pulled all the three arm once and I have this result in front of me. Now, what do you think I should do? Should I keep pulling slot machine to continuously? Uh, is that go with the second one first because it gave the better result first time? OK, let's say I do that again. I get a reward of 75. Now. My average is 37.5 in this. Uh, so since it gave uh, a good result again, so we can continue with it. OK, let's continue. Yes, yeah, so this is the total. OK, so this uh, this is the total actually which is happening. This is the reward the. This time step reward, so if I pull it again. I get reward of 50. Let's say I pull it again. Now I get a reward of five. OK, so you see this is the distribution that is coming up. So my reward is here five. Once I got 30, I got so 20% of the time I got a reward of 30, then 40, 50, 45. Okay. If I pull this again, I get this. Okay. So you see this, uh, this is also evolving. Let's say I pull this now. Okay. Again, I got zero. Again, I got zero. So I'm repeatedly getting, no, now I got some reward. Okay. I got. A reward of two sometime. Right. If I pull this, I got some reward. I got a reward of 80. This time I got a reward of 40. Yes. Yeah, so you guys understand that right, what is happening. Each arm pull 
a single arm pull is not sufficient to determine the reward okay so like i said reward is not a singular value it's rather a distribution so if i plot a histogram if i let's say pull each arm a thousand times i should get a histogram plot over here okay so one histogram might be a bit steeper one histogram might be more widespread and so on okay if i do this now i again got a reward of 0 uh yeah i got now this time i got a reward of 10 and so on okay so what i do is i'll just run it 10000 times when i clicked on run i pulled each lever 1000 times and this is the distribution that i ex that i got from it okay so what can we infer from this so for each different slot machine there are three different reward distribution that i am getting anyone and this is the average reward also If you got a win at this casino, then you need to pull the green slot machine. Yeah, so the uh, idea is if I pull the green machine on an average, I should expect to get a reward of 56.4. Okay, if I pull the uh, red machine on an average, I get a reward of 1.4. And if I pull this, I got an average of 17.2, right? I run this again. I, I will keep getting this this particular thing, okay? So now this 56.52, if I run it again, it might change. So this is like an average, but uh, why? Because this is a stochastic uh, arm pull that I'm doing, right? So you understand what we mean by a stochastic arm pull, right? What do we mean by stochastic rewards? Okay, I'll tell you stochastic means probabilistic. Okay, so if I pull the same arm for the same state, I might get a different reward. That is possible, right? If I pull this arm once, if I pull it twice, I'll get a different reward. Why? Because my state is different. So the reward is actually a function of what the combination is, what the state is, and what my action is, right? The stochasticity is in the sense that here after 10,000 trials, I got a total reward of this much. If I repeat this again, if I do a fresh 10,000 trial, this number might change, this number might change. But the good thing is the average distribution is something that we come to know of. Okay, If I do, let's say, a 1 million trials for each different slot machine, I'll get a more finer uh, distribution of the rewards. Right? Okay, Now if I show this, this is the expected. This is what the casino owner had said earlier. When he designed this, so this is what the owner had designed that the expected reward for slot machine was 1.24. For this, this is 56.69. For this, this is 3.58. So you see, uh, we got closer in these two cases, but in this case, we are not very close, right? Why? Why do you think we are not very close here? And do you think we can get closer if I run it again? Let's say I reset everything. If I run this again, see now I'm very close, right? To all these three. Uh, so earlier the blue one was not uh, uh, a smooth, a smooth uh, decrease. Like mm -hmm. earlier, uh, over here also, <coughs> the red one is a smooth decrease. Uh, the the first one is the highest one. It's like a. Um, it's like an exponential graph. Uh, I'm not okay. uh, like a hyperbolic graph. So mm -hmm. it goes uh, to the top at the first and then it gradually comes down to the bottom. Okay. Uh, same, okay. same with these over here, uh, the two over here. But earlier in the blue one, the mm -hmm. um, like it there was a double edge graph. There yeah, was two it peaks, was not right? in between. Mm -hmm. So yeah, when I reset it, the expected value also changes. Okay, if I reset it and run it again, so now I'll get a different 
thing, right? So you understand what happens. Like each day, the slot machines are reset. Okay. So what worked for you on day one might not work for you on day two. So when I reset, that means I'm moving on to a new day. Okay. <clears throat> now you can you tell me what do you think is problematic in what I did or what like what is an assumption? I I figured out how to uh, to know which slot machine gives me the optimal reward. But what did I lose in that process? Like we all can agree, right? After 10,000 trials, we can get a fair enough estimate at what the average reward is. And it is kind of close to the expected value. Okay. For practical purposes, it is very close to the expected value. If I increase the number of trials, then this distance will be further minimized. But yeah, what did I lose in this process? You had to do 10,000 iterations. Oh. Correct. I need to do 10,000 iterations. And like I said, <clears throat> each machine pool has a cost associated with it. Okay. I actually have to put in some money to do the trial, right? So me, if I want to go to a casino tomorrow and <clears throat> play this game, I don't have the luxury to do 30,000 trials, right? To figure out which is the best slot machine that I should repeatedly pull. Right. So what can be done in a smart way so that I don't waste 30,000 trials? Let's say I do 10 to 30 trials and still figure out the best possible arm is. Or the best possible slot machine is. Okay, forget about slot machines. Let's say a more practical example. Let's say I come to Mumbai tomorrow. And let's say near the KJ Sumaya campus, there are three restaurants. Okay, let's say uh, red, green, and blue. Now I have to stay there for let's say a year and I need to figure out which is my favorite restaurant. Okay, now the taste of each restaurant might be different on each day, right? Or my mood might be different. Okay, so someday I might feel I'm in the mood for uh, something exotic or something simpler, and that way the tastes varies. Sometimes the weather also plays a part, right? So sometimes in summer, I would, let's say, prefer to eat something more light. And in winter, I might prefer to eat something more comfort or heavy, right? So that's how the, uh, the reward is also evolving, right? So sometimes my mood is a bit different. Sometimes it might happen that the chef is on a leave and you have a backup chef creating food for you. So you don't think of it as a slot machine in general. Think of it as any real life example where you're tasked with choosing a particular uh, option over all set of options. Like eventually I want to figure out what my go-to restaurant is when I'm there. And I don't want to do after let's say eating at each restaurant 30,000 times. Okay, I want to do it let's after 10 or 15 trials. I should confidently say that, okay, uh, I should prefer uh, the orange restaurant over the other two. So uh, we need a smart way to do that, right? So what do you think could be one way? After trying uh, the three of them as for some time, mm -hmm. like ten uh, over here, like 10 or 40 times, uh, we can then start comparing between the three of them. OK, and let's do that here. But let's try your hypothesis. What should I do? Try it for 10, 40 times for each of them. Okay, let's say one, two, three, four. Okay, 10 trials. Let's say 14, 15 trials I'll do. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> let's say I did this. Okay, I did one extra, but okay.
Okay, let's do 16 for each, okay, to make it consistent. I have done 16 trials for each, okay? And this is what I get. So you see here in the last trial, it, I got very lucky. I got a score of 324 that actually increased my average. So one high score over here increased my total average to 354. But in that 354, 250 came in just the last trial, in the 16th trial. Before the first 15 trials didn't yield me that good result. Now what to do? Any idea? I have done 16 trials for each now. Instead of just taking the average, you could try maybe weighted average. Weighted average as in? Uh, like the recent uh, trial, the most recent uh, trial should give, I should give it a higher exactly. weightage. No, 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 not, not like that. I was thinking like uh, if you have, if you have like, uh, uh, like number of tri trials uh, multiplied by the reward like that. Like number of zeros you got into the zero, so zero into zero will be that, that much only. But like for maybe yeah, like we have forty this total, right? Yeah, we have this total, right? Yeah. So uh, we have the total score here in front of us. That is a reward into number like all rewards into all the trials. Acha, okay. Now if I just want to see what the actual score is, so you see this is the expected score. This is also, of course, we don't know this, okay? This is something that the restaurant owner or the slot uh, machine owner, the casino owner has set. We are trying to estimate this reward. So the average is our estimate. This is the uh, true value, which we don't know. Unless I click on show, I don't know this, okay? But let's say after 16 trials, what I would have done? Let's say I would have figured this to be true and I would have gone with this, okay? But it might happen that I might get lucky twice in a row in this. And so the total score over here would be much higher. Whereas the expected score is much lower, right? Do you get my point? Like I might get lucky with the orange one, let's say three times in a row, so that in the first 15 trials, this gives me a very high score, okay? But if I do it for 10,000 trials, over time, the average would be very, very low. Meaning on three days, the restaurant uh, made some really exceptional food, but most of the days they don't uh, make that great food. Just think about how we, you as a human would behave, okay? Don't think, uh, like, think of it more from an intuition perspective. Let's say you're exploring a new place. What would you do? You don't uh, take 16 trials, right? So first and then decide, okay, this is the restaurant I would like to go to. Sometimes your mode is like, oh, I'm hungry. I should go with whatever best I have till now. I, I know that till now, restaurant uh, Orange provides the best food, so I'll try to go there. Something like that, right? Think how, how a human would behave in such scenario. Yes. Uh, the blue one has more consistency, so we'll go with that. Yeah, but we don't know that, right? The consistency. Oh. Mm -hmm. In the general scenario, in um, the restaurant scenario, we choose the orange one because we are getting, uh, you got lucky in the last trial. So hmm. the tendency would yeah. be, let's go there. Yeah, I got I got a reward of 250 in the last trial, right? So naturally I yeah. would think, okay, I should go there again, right? So now if I want to formalize this thing, okay, let's say I run this for 10,000 trials and this is what I get. Okay, you see this average is, bad because I got lucky here, which spoiled the average for me. I should, if I reset this, so things things like this happens usually, right? In in a real life scenario, these things often happens. You might get lucky in some trial. You might think, oh, I got lucky here. So this might be the best possible action. So I should keep doing that repeatedly. But if you do that repeatedly, you're actually missing out on something else, right? 
So uh, think of it like this. Let's actually compare. Uh, okay, before that, uh, I would like to introduce you to an algorithm which we guys call as the uh, epsilon greedy. Okay, what I'll do is eventually, first, I'll pull all these three arms together. Okay, I get the average, I keep a track of the average at each trial. Okay, now. Should I always go with the one which has the highest uh, average? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I should always go with the one with the highest average. Okay, let's say if I reset everything, let's say I put everything is zero. Okay, first trial, I did this. All my average is zero. Here, if I pull, my average is 50. Here, if I pull, my average is five. Now, what should I do? Should I always go with the highest average? Uh, initially, we'll go with the highest average one, but if we see that uh, later on, that's right. Average lowers down, then we can go try others. Okay, but what if it doesn't low, lower down? Let's say I get an average of let's say 900 in one chance. I got very lucky. I got a score of 900. And even if I get a string of low scores for a period of time, my average would still be higher than 0 and 5, right? Like, for example, here I got 50. So I'll pull this again. I got 40. Now average is 40. Now average is again 40. I'm at 41. I'm at 41. So I should keep pulling this, right? Till infinity. That's that's what it feels like to me, right? Yes. But by greedy approach, uh, this is. Uh, Some right. optimal. So uh, you understand there was a term here. Exploration versus exploitation trade off. So maybe now you can understand what this means, right? So do you want to explore more or do you want to exploit the best possible knowledge that you have? So in those uh, uh, machine scenarios, Exploration mm -hmm. will be uh, pulling the lever. Choosing something suboptimal. No, I'll tell you what exploration means. Exploration means you are going okay. with the not the best option. Like I know uh, my average is 41. That is the best option. So if I choose that, that means I'm exploiting. But if I let's say no, this average is zero. If I try this once more, that means I'm exploring. Okay. Okay. And uh, choosing the best. Uh, choosing the green machine here will be exploitation. Yes, I am exploiting the best knowledge that I have. Yes. So this is a very important so trade-off, right? Like exploration and exploitation. Yeah, that that is the. Uh, key here, right? We need to somehow balance this exploration and exploitation. If we do a pure exploration, OK, so if I when I say pure exploration, if I pull a random arm each time, then that is not adding to my knowledge anyway, right? I'm just exploring. I'm not uh, getting any knowledge out of it. And if I do a very pure exploitation, then that means I'm not sufficiently exploring other options. That means my vision is very myopic, OK? I'm very conservative in my approach. So that oftentimes will give me a suboptimal action. Like for example, we saw right, we got a 950 score somewhere here. We got lucky ones. So my exploitation would be I'll keep doing that again and again, but eventually the expected score was much lower. I I might have missed out on the green one because I got lucky over here and I chose to exploit it uh, till the time I was there. So I missed out on other options which were actually better. Right. That is also an important uh, summary. In reinforcement learning, it is very important to balance the exploration versus the exploitation, right? <clears throat> now you know what the terminology is. What is exploration? What is exploitation? Now, can you tell me a way how you can balance this two together? Like I'll tell you, but I want you to think. Let's discuss. 
let's get more involved in the discussion. It's true. Uh, you mentioned so you need this, to balance. Yeah, yeah. Please. So in this case, to balance the exploitation and exploration part, uh, we can uh, pull the lever for uh, uh, for every machine for mm -hmm. some trials and then uh, go for the exploitation and choose uh, whichever machine is giving us the best reward. OK, so what is the number of trials that you want to try? 100 for each? In machine scenario, it is doable, but in not uh, real mm -hmm. life scenario. Yes. For the um, restaurant yes. uh, scenario, we can't uh, do 100 trials. Yes. Right. Uh, we can do this that the uh, we can give the one uh, giving better results more chances, but uh, mm -hmm. we will also explore other uh, options too. Like we okay. can uh, we can try the red one two times, the green one ten times, and then the blue one four times like this. Okay, and okay, that's interesting. Up. Interesting. So uh, if you give it a percentage to exploration exploration, let's give it a percent split. Okay. So do you want to do 50 50 or 60 40? What is it? Yeah, more than 50 50, like uh, more on the exploitation side. So is 80 20 a good number? And uh, I want to extreme. That's too extreme. Something Wait. like uh, 70 30 or 60 40. OK, OK. OK, you are on the right track, but uh, think uh, think a bit more. OK, so it's like if I exploit initially more, then exploration is limited. But initially I want to explore more, right? If I don't know anything. Initially, I want to exploit, explore more, but let's say after I have, let's say, done 1 billion trials, okay? Let's say this number of trials is 1 billion, 10 billion. Then I know with 99.99% accuracy, which is the best possible action. Now, I don't need to do 30% exploration over there, right? That is just wastage of trials, right? Do you understand my point? Yes. After some number of time, I need to stop the exploration. <coughs> Initially, yes, I need to do exploration. Initially, I need to explore more, but eventually I need to. Choose the best possible action, right? That is also a requirement for me. You are on the right track. You need to do some sort of a split between exploration and exploitation. But yes, yes, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Uh, so I was thinking we can try all the slot machines, uh, say 10 times initially, explore all the options. Uh, say slot machine 2 is giving the highest rewards. So mm -hmm. we continue exploiting it and if the mm -hmm. uh, we check the average. So we keep track of the average if the average like falls significantly. So we were getting luckier on the first few tries and since we started exploiting it got worse. So then maybe we can start exploring all the other options again. And then exploit those. Okay, so uh, you are eventually keeping a track of this average, right? Right. You are keeping a track of the average at each instance, and then you are trying to basically uh, choose the one with the highest average. And if it falls, then only you go to the next next one. Is that what you mean? So I did ten trials. If the average is forty one, I repeatedly do this. If it falls below two point five, then I switch. Uh, no, if it, uh, I don't think uh, if it falls below 2.5, if it just falls like a very significant amount, so I don't know how you decide that, but <laughs> not 2.5, because we have not, okay. maybe we got unlucky on the other slot machines, which are the good Correct. ones. <laughs> okay, interesting. Uh, yeah, so you guys on the right track, you are saying that initially I would like to explore because I don't know anything and eventually I really would like to. Make sure that my explore exploration goes to zero with time. OK, so there is an approach. So you know the greedy approach, right? All of you are familiar with the greedy approach. When I say greedy, greedy means 100% exploitation. That's the greedy approach, right? Yes. Yes, 
So uh, one alternative way to think of it is something called as an epsilon greedy. Okay. So when I say epsilon greedy, so this epsilon is a very small quantity. So you can think of it as a near greedy approach. Okay. So this epsilon is actually a percentage. Okay. So you can think of it as a 0.2 epsilon, 0.2 greedy. So when I say 0.2, that means I am greedy 80% of the time. So with uh, one minus epsilon percent, uh, one minus epsilon probability, I am being greedy. But with epsilon probability, I am exploding. Okay. Clear? Yes. So this this approach called epsilon greedy. So one minus epsilon. Uh, with the one minus epsilon probability, I am being greedy. So this epsilon is a very small number. Okay, so let's epsilon. It's let's say 0.25. So I can say 0.75 uh, with 0.75 probability, I am being greedy, and with 0.25 probability, I am exploring. Okay. So the uh, issue with the epsilon greedy is that the epsilon is a constant, right? And we don't want a constant. So there is another method called as decaying epsilon greedy. So what do you think this could be? Similar to the idea that we discussed, right? If we keep epsilon to be constant, then even after let's say a thousand or a billion number of trials, I would still have that small exploration component, which I don't want. Eventually, I want to explore it, right? What do you think this could be? So with time, the exploration part uh, reduces, and at a certain amount of time, after a certain amount of time. We'll just exploit, mm -hmm. won't explore. Yes, that is correct. So your epsilon initially is a very high value, and with time, so this epsilon is a function of time, and with time, this epsilon goes to zero. Meaning, when epsilon goes to zero, that's a greedy, greedy approach, right? Got it. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so let's see comparison. So to a just a different policies, we consider 10 slot machines. Each is a reward system that follows a normal distribution. So are you guys aware of what a normal distribution is? Uh, yes, yes. So what do you mean by normal distribution? Do you guys know about Gaussian distribution? Yes. So this is this is what a normal distribution looks like. Okay, so it's like there is a peak in the middle and as the side it tapers down. Okay, so it's like a bell curve kind of a uh, distribution that you have. That is what we mean by a normal distribution. So in this experiment, there are 10 slot machines. Each reward is a normal distribution, so it's not like an exponential distribution or something. So I have 10 different machines. All of them will have a normal kind of a distribution. Use the sliders to adjust the mean of the normal distribution. Use the parameters to set the iteration number. For each different methods, non stationary option moves the mean of the normal distribution by 0.5 in either direction. This happens at 20% of the total iterations. So what this is saying is I'll have 10 different slot machines. Each of them will have a distribution. Okay, so here I can adjust the mean of these 10 machines. So when I say mean, that means where the peak would be. So if the peak is at zero, okay, if the peak is at zero, that means uh, eventually I'll get a reward of zero, but uh, based on the standard deviation, uh, some might taper off faster, some might taper off slower. So the range is defined by the uh, slope of the hill, right? And when I say non stationary is true, that means it moves the mean of the distribution by 0.5 in either direction. This happens at 20% of the total iteration. Okay, so let's say if I select non stationary, that means the mean after every fifth iteration, the mean can shift by a factor by plus or minus 0.5 in either direction. So the reward is also changing with time. Okay, so when I say non stationary, the reward is changing. And my decay factor is 1.2. So decay factor is my epsilon initially is a very high value. 
my epsilon with each iteration will decay by a factor of 0.3 okay so let's take a predefined case let's say i take case 1 okay so here this are this is how the 10 different slot machine looks like so this is how the mean of the 10 different slot machine looks like okay let's forget ucb for now this is a different algorithm so let's compare epsilon 1 epsilon 2 epsilon 1 is 0.1 and epsilon 2 is 0.3 okay that means 10 percent exploration this is 30 percent exploration dk epsilon is you uh start with epsilon is uh one and then over time it becomes zero right and greedy is a pure greedy strategy right so if i run this for 10 different slot machines this is how the results look like okay so what i am seeing is on the x-axis i am showing the average reward curve okay so this is the reward that i collect okay over time do you get my point if i let's do it let's say 10,000 times i run this so after 10,000 trials at each trial this is the total cumulative reward that i get right so what is uh something what is uh it that we can infer from it any idea let's even remove this non-stationarity part let's keep it a stationary problem yeah what do you think could be an inference like do you understand what this graph tells me Uh, After the point, the reward is constant. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. After a certain amount of iterations, we don't need to uh, explore. Yeah, that is true. So this this is the reward. Okay. So this is like what the reward is at each different time step, right? So how many times I'm choosing this particular? This is the average reward that I get over different different time steps. So let's say if I take a look at this epsilon 0.1. So what it tells me is if I do a 10 percent exploration. So I'll end up somewhere here. OK. So my average reward would be around 2.5 after 10,000 trials, right? If I do 0.1 epsilon. If I do 0.3 epsilon, my average would be 1.6. And if I do a pure greedy, my average would be 0 0.997, right? And if I do this epsilon DK, that makes takes my average a bit higher. Okay, you ignore this UCB for now, but take a look at this four plots. And what do you think is an inference that you can draw? With uh, epsilon DK, we are getting mm. better results. Yes. And that is something that uh, you can uh, also explain why you are getting right. Yeah, after some uh, amount of trials, we can stop exploring and we just know which one is the best to exploit so we can continue exploring. Correct, correct. So uh, yes, so this epsilon DK gives me the best uh, result because <clears throat> as uh, we discussed, we don't want to forever explore after a certain point of time. We want to make the exploration to be zero so that we get as close as possible to the. Uh, we get to exploit more in the long run, right? So if you constantly explore, so you see there is a shift in the uh, reward because 10% of the time I'm choosing a suboptimal action, even after knowing that this is not the best action, but I'll still choose that that takes my average down when epsilon is 0.3 that takes my average even further down and greedy we know right we if we get lucky sometime and we keep on selecting then we have a tendency to select a non optimal arm or a non optimal action right now let's say this is a scenario okay where each slot machine have a reward of 5 okay so i know my average uh, reward would be 5 in each case right so which one do you think should work first You see what happened here.
My mean is five, irrespective of whatever arm I choose. My mean uh, reward would be five. Just the deviation around it would be different. So if this is true, then all of them kind of uh, did what they expected to do. They eventually figured out that any approach that I choose, I'll end up with the average uh, arm of five, right? Average reward of five, right? Now, what if I make it non-stationary? When I say non-stationary, that means the reward moves by plus or minus 0.5 with a 20% probability, right? Let's say if I run this, now something interesting happens, right? Now, where is my green curve? Yeah, can you explain what happened around here? What I did is I just take the non-stationary part, right? That is my mean is five, but with a 20% chance, the mean can either increase or decrease in the positive or the negative direction, right? That means my reward is not a stationary, but it changes with time. So uh, if we are uh, reducing the exploration in the later phases, but uh, if we think like a slot num a slot machine two is giving the best rewards now, so mm -hmm. uh, like exp exp with epsilon DK, we can uh, stop exploring the other options and exploit slot machine two, for example. But then what mm -hmm. may happen is it's uh, it's mean might get like reduced every time. So mm. uh, not exploring the other options will significantly hurt our performance now. Yes, and that is what is happening here also, right? If you, for a non-stationary case, if you go with, let's say, epsilon 0.3 or epsilon 0.1 works fine, but more exploration hurts in the long run, right? And as usual, the green one is performing better, but the red curve is also not performing as worse as the brown or blue curve, right? Okay. So to wrap this up, what I uh, wanted to show is, even if you have a constant epsilon, okay, even if you have a constant epsilon, while for a non, for a stationary case, it might perform worse than the DK case, but when we have a non-stationary case, the performance is almost as similar to the DK case, right? Why? Because we need to constantly explore, right? Because the mean is changing. I need to always keep exploring, right? I can't make exploration to be zero at a certain point. Do you understand? Uh, if we have to uh, constantly explore, then how come this epsilon dk it is giving us a similar result as epsilon 0.1? That is also interesting. Uh, let's try this again and see. I do this non stationary and run. And also, it is giving similar. Yeah, where is the green plot? Yeah, now it's not behaving similarly, right? Now, see the difference. We just got lucky because then, uh, uh, because then epsilon dk, the epsilon will be reduced. It will become zero at this point. This became zero. Yeah. Yeah. You can see that this is exactly the point where the epsilon dk became zero. And because my uh, mean is shifting and because of not exploring, the average went down a lot. Right. It might happen that the arm that it was choosing became, let's say, minus two in the long run and because I had set my exploration to zero, I kept on selecting even though it decreased, uh, the value kept on decreasing. Right. Yeah. Okay. 
questions. So what do you think uh, would be a conclusion of what we just discussed so far? Anyone can wrap it up. So let's see how many people are there actually. Oh, there are 35 people. Nice. So for a uh, um, stationary approach, decaying mm-hmm. epsilon greedy approach is working so far the best. And for uh, non-stationary, uh, mm-hmm. epsilon with 0.1, the that approach works best. It, uh, it might work for this case, but you can't always... Uh... Yeah say that right because let's say i take let's say instead of 10 i take 100 slot machines then i might need to explore a bit more right there is no fixed formula okay so like i said this this whole point again this exploration versus exploitation trade-off is not a very straightforward trade-off okay this depends more on the application perspective on what are the different different parameters so if you notice here i have many different parameters that i can vary okay if i change any one parameter significantly the plots it affects the plot eventually right so the uh is we as a designer or we as a developer need to tread this exploration versus exploitation line very uh finely right if we are not careful then uh with a slight change the rewards vary a lot let's say if i change this dk Let's say I make it 0.9, okay. Now you see something different happened. Now this epsilon decay works better compared to this, right? And why this is the case? Because when I made this epsilon to be 0.1, where the best possible arm that I was exploiting, it fell down rapidly. From here till here, it fell down rapidly. But because I had 10% exploration, I still managed to move up, but not not. Uh, that well, but here in this case, if I have let's say point exploration, the drop off was not very significant, right? Even if the best possible action that I was exploiting till now it fell off because I had 30% exploration, it still balanced the overall uh, reward. Okay, so it didn't allow it to fall this much. Now you realize that you can't. We can't always say that point one is better than point three. It is very much dependent on the application that we have at hand, right? Okay, so it totally depends on the current scenario, I guess, right? It depends on the current scenario. It depends on the stationarity, non-stationarity. It depends on what are the hyperparameters that you are setting, how many number of arms that you have. So here we have 10 slot machines. Let's say if I have 1000 slot machines, it's not a very straightforward answer to uh, wrap up the discussion today. The answer is not very straightforward and it's a very open ended question also in RL right now. How do you balance this exploration versus the exploitation trade off? Do you keep on exploring more? Do you exploit what you have currently or how uh, one can uh, basically make or design a robust algorithm such that this balances? Okay. So yeah, this is what I had in mind today to give you a flavor of what this multi arm bandit is. So I think it's around 9 p.m. for you. So if you have any other questions, please feel free to ask. Anything apart from what we discussed, anything you think could be interesting. So I'm happy to uh, discuss. Please feel free to ask. Uh, I wanted to ask this, like, uh, why is Epsilon D, uh, like greedy? Or epsilon decay not always the best. Why it is not always the best? Yeah. Okay. So you saw why epsilon decay works, right? For a stationary case, epsilon decay will perform the best, and that is understandable, right? If the rewards are constant over time, I would want the exploration to go to zero eventually. So my epsilon decay is a perfect strategy to achieve this, right? Yeah. 
but let's say if my rewards are non stationary okay so if i eventually make this epsilon to be zero my dk is zero over time then any slight change in the reward it might happen that i am selecting the first arm as the best arm and i'm going on exploiting it but eventually the reward dynamics changed okay now arm 5 became the best arm and i'm because my dk because it has dk to zero i might not uh, i'm continuously selecting a sub optimal arm that might happen also uh, right i see i see i get it i get it i need to have some scope of exploration always so if i have a constant exploration for a non stationary case i should always try to keep have a some factor of exploration with me always and this is the case in most of rl applications right so this epsilon greedy algorithm is one of the most popular uh, algorithm techniques or algorithms to balance this exploration exploration trade off and this works in both cases okay so if i take the stationary case Let's say case one. Okay, let's take case two. Ten thousand. No. Okay. Yeah. So here, uh, this. No. Yeah. In this case, you see that uh, the epsilon dk. while it is performing the best in a stationary case the epsilon greedy is not very far off right from the dk case but uh, the dk is only performing better because it's a very, yeah. uh, steady distribution like the distribution is not changing over time but if i add a time component to the reward <clears throat> then having some sort of exploration is always helpful right okay i'll uh, maybe i can show one more example and then maybe we can stop <coughs> okay let's go here okay so let's take a dynamic uh, programming approach okay so let's say i have a grid over here right in fact we should be taking a look at this video Okay, so uh, here I'm jumping a bit from the uh, simple problem that we discussed, uh, a slightly more complicated variant. Okay, so it's a navigation problem. Okay, you have a grid world, so you have a, you place a robot somewhere. Let's say I click here, I place a robot here, and this is the goal location. Let's say the robot wants to go here. Okay, and I can put some obstacles along the path. Right, so the the path taken by the robot is not very straight forward and there are certain areas if i put a plus sign that means if i go there i should get a high reward so that means i want my uh, robot to pass through this uh, plus signs okay and similarly if i put a minus sign that means if i go there i'll get a very high penalty that means i want my agent to not go to this particular state right similarly i have the wind scenario so if i go let's say somewhere here if i reach here i will be pushed in this direction right so the wind probability is 0.7 that means if i reach here with a 70% 70% chance is i go in this direction okay so you can add wind at multiple places so uh, let's say uh, you train your uh, rl agent so even you are again you have a choice right <clears throat> you want to basically uh, select actions given the state that you have in order to reach the goal 
if I run this, so this is how uh, the arrows look like. Okay, so it tells me that if I'm at this particular position, I should move in this direction or this direction. If I'm at in this position, I should move in this direction. If I'm over here, I should move up. So what it is giving me is it is giving me a mapping from state to action. So each individual cell over here is a state. Okay. So if I'm at in this state, what action I should take? So here, the RL agent tells me that I should go up, and that is also true, right? Because any other action will keep me in the same possible state, right? And you can see that the arrow is pointing towards the plus sign, but when it is near the minus sign, it is actually pointing away from it, right? <laughs> so let's say I take this example, okay? Now it's a robot is here. It wants to go here. How will it go? If I run this. This is the best possible path, right? If I'm here, I should go either here or here. If I'm here, I go this side. If I'm at this, if I am starting from this position, I should go here. So it's like a. Um, this is what we mean by a policy, right? Policy is basically mapping from state to action. So a policy, it's a representation of a policy, right? For each state, what is the action that I should be taking? This is something that a policy is. This is something that the agent should learn eventually, right? Now let's say this is the case. So you have wind in this, okay? So if we go straight up, you'll be pushed down constantly. So what you should do? So obviously you should try to go up in this direction you know, as uh, as much possible as you can because the wind probability is 0.7. But let's say if you're here, the uh, policy is telling me instead of going to the left, I should try to take this path because it's a more favorable path for me. Right, and I can also always add scenarios in this. Yeah, this is one example. So this is like a fire. Okay, if I go here, then I die. Okay, and if I go somewhere here, I I'll be pushed into the fire, and my aim is to reach over here. So what I should be doing? So this is how the policy looks like. Right? Is this clear till now? If not, we'll discuss this in more detail tomorrow. But I'm just showing this example out to you. Yes. OK. And this is another example. So let's say this entire thing is blocked. So the only way to reach the goal is if I enter this tunnel and I exit from here. OK, so all my policies. So if I'm here, my arrow shouldn't point this side. I shouldn't. The arrow here shouldn't point to the right side because if I go to the right, I'll hit a wall. So the arrow should always point me towards this tunnel. If I reach this tunnel, then I am sure to reach the goal, right? So this is what the agent should learn, and this is exactly what this is showing here. Uh, actually, I have a question over here. So in mm -hmm. here, the uh, problem is divided into two parts. One is like entering the tunnel, that uh, red tunnel. Uh, if you are not inside the <coughs> smaller square. And then if you are in the smaller square, then you have to reach the goal. So like uh, how exactly are you are giving it a, the red tunnel reward lesser than the goal state reward? Sorry, can you repeat? Are you like giving the tunnel, the in tunnel, a lesser reward than the goal state reward so that it is going there first? No, my reward is simple. So my reward is win reward is one, lose reward is minus one. Okay, so the, how are you how are you conditioning it to go into the tunnel then? So I, sometimes if I don't reach the reward, I give it a minus one at the end of the episode. If I reach the goal, I give it a reward of one. And if I the hope is if I try it multiple number of times, it should go into the tunnel. Uh, e yeah, that part. But then uh, this uh, begs the question: like, if you have a very complex uh, situation where your uh, win reward is one, and it's a very uh, difficult case to reach, and then mm -hmm. uh, maybe you tried all the possible combinations during random probability, and you never ever reach the goal. So how would you like try to overcome that situation? So that is where the reward design aspect comes, right? So you need to hand design the reward in a way to make sure that you are rewarding those actions that is pushing you to this tunnel. So that's what I uh, meant when I said that the assumption is your uh, behavior is only as good as your reward is, right? 
Well, this is a very simple example. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, sorry. Again, this is uh, a dynamic uh, programming approach. So it's like at each uh, time, I have the knowledge of all the states and based on the knowledge of all the states, I'm taking an action. So this is not really a fully RL setup. This is a dynamic programming approach. So it's like I take in the sum of all the states in the previous time steps and based on that, I take an action, right? So. I and in it. this example, we are using greedy approach, right? Uh, where the reward is better. No, no, it's absolute greedy. It's okay. always absolute greedy. The selection, action selection, is always an absolute greedy that we should use. Okay. Again, I'm jumping a bit over here. This is something that uh, won't be clear to you unless you understand what is the difference in dynamic programming, Monte Carlo, and stuff. But yeah, this is like a full RL setup. If I, let's say, go here. This is where I don't have information about all the states. I only have the information about uh, those states where I visited. If I don't visit that particular state, I don't update their probabilities, right? So when I say 10,000 iteration, that means I start from here, sorry. I start from here. I try some random combination and it, if I don't uh, reach the goal, then it's a failure. That is one iteration. So I do 10,000 different trajectories, okay? And see, this is what it tells me. So because now, interestingly, earlier uh, I was doing a dynamic programming approach. That is, I was actually visiting each state 10,000 times and then computing the probability. Here, this is an RL case, okay? So I never really visited these, these states, got it? Because I know that initially this was giving me a favorable result. So if, if I get initialized in these, these places, I'll try to go over here. And because my robot is always initialized here, so I never had the chance to explore these part. And uh, naturally the these uh, boxes didn't get any probabilities. Right? So this is uh, what we did through Epsilon Greedy, right? So my initial epsilon yeah. is 0 0.3 and the epsilon reduction factor is 1.1. This is a very deterministic case. It's a stationary reward case, right? Okay, yeah. this is clear. Okay, I think uh, we covered a lot today. We can stop the discussion here. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, is there any uh, set of rules or anything like that to uh, balance the exploitation and exploration trade-off? Are there any uh, protocols as such, or it's there pure, are there uh, different different algorithms? Try and try no, okay. there are different algorithms. Like like I said, epsilon greedy. This point, uh, epsilon greedy is one of the most popular approach. It works in the case of stationary as well as non-stationary case. We saw right. Yeah, so according to the case, we'll choose the algorithm. Even if you don't, even if you just go with the epsilon greedy approach, it works 95% of the time in most RL cases. Other than that, okay. there are other algorithms like you saw UCB. We didn't discuss what UCB is. That is one another approach. There is another approach called the softmax approach. UCB has different, different variations. Uh, epsilon greedy algorithms also has different different small small variations so people have been researching on these these aspects how to make this balance as more as much sophisticated as possible so yeah like like epsilon greedy there are ucbs and other popular strategy people use but it is very much dependent on the applications there is no fixed or a deterministic protocol to determine which is the best approach in this case. Oh. Okay. Any more questions? Otherwise, we can call it a day today. Okay, I think there are no more questions.
So with this, we conclude the first day of our three day workshop. Thank you to Mana for his insight and, and it was a wonderful session and we hope to see you guys tomorrow at the same time for more insights in reinforcement. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. See you guys tomorrow. Bye. Thank you, Manav. Thank you, everyone.